Hello and welcome to Navarra Live. I'm Moy Lady McLean and tonight I'm joined by Helena, aka No Justice MTG on YouTube and Twitch. Helena. Always good to see you. I love joining you on the show, Moya, and I look forward to it today. Coming up later tonight, a dummy inquiry into murderer Wayne Cousins has found police forces missed multiple red flags in hiring him. And we examine the Tory safe seat candidate who prosecuted a man over an emoji. Israeli tanks are reported to have opened fire on hundreds of Palestinians waiting for food aid in northern Gaza. Al Jazeera Arabic reports that this was the moment that the shooting began. The assault took place west of Gaza City. The Gazan Health Authority reports that more than 100 Palestinians were killed, calling it a, quote, blood-stained massacre. As no ambulances could reach the area, bodies were loaded onto trucks. A further than 700 people have been reported to be injured, with reports that tanks ran over the injured and the dead. However, Israel is telling a different story. In fact, it's telling three different stories. The IDF released this footage showing large crowds of Palestinians surrounding aid trucks, which is no surprise. Gazans are starving to death. And with Israel blocking aid into the enclave and disabling its distribution systems, they are obviously desperate. But Israel went further, saying the video shows looting, with the result that dozens of Gazans were injured as a result of pushing and trampling. After images of large numbers of dead appeared, a second story emerged from the IDF camp. Speaking on Sky, this was Israeli government spokesperson Avi Hyman. My understanding um, currently is that um, lorries were coming in with uh, with aid um, from the Rafa crossing, which connects Egypt and uh, and the Gaza Strip. And as those lorries of aid was come were coming in. They were overpowered. They were um, overwhelmed, I should say, by uh, Gazan civilians trying to violently loot from uh, from those aid trucks. And at some point, uh, the driver, who was himself a Gazan civilian, um, plowed into the crowd. And uh, my understanding is that there's tens of casualties. Again, it's it's unfolding, and I would encourage you to. Uh, be in close touch with the uh, Israel Defense Forces who are investigating, it's, you know, lo- looking into uh, what happened there. At the same time, Israel's security minister, Itamar ben Gavir posted a different version of events saying this. This is the rough translation of a tweet on X. Total support must be given to our heroic fighters operating in Gaza who acted excellently against a Gazan mob that tried to harm them. Today, it was proven that the transfer of humanitarian aid to Gaza is not only madness while our abductees are being held in the Strip under substandard conditions, but also endangers the IDF soldiers. This is another clear reason why we must stop transferring this aid, which is in fact aid to harm the IDF soldiers and give oxygen to Hamas. What we're seeing here is the development of a narrative from Israel that has just one aim. It wants to ensure that no matter what information emerges, somehow the Palestinians who were killed will be responsible for their own deaths. First, they were a mob who killed each other. Then they were a mob killed by a Palestinian lorry driver. Then they were a mob that the IDF were forced to shell and run over with tanks in order to protect themselves. And even if any of those narratives were true, which they aren't. Responsibility for the conditions that have led to such large crowds desperate for food belongs entirely to Israel. Food in the Strip is now so scarce that six children have died of malnutrition in Gaza's hospitals, according to the health ministry. But it's not just Al Jazeera reporting on the starvation in the enclave. This is an opinion piece in the New York Times, not exactly a Palestinian-friendly newspaper. Starvation is stalking Gaza's children, reads the headline. The article says this. Relief organisations in Gaza struggle to figure out whether the crisis has crossed formally into famine. Statistically, the clearest indication is that at least two people out of every 10,000 die every day from starvation. 
They measure the circumference of children's upper arms to document the peril of their weight loss. These children are not suffering from drought or crop failure or some other natural disaster. Their hunger is a man-made catastrophe. The Israeli government has slowed and even prevented food aid from entering the besieged Gaza Strip. Even when trucks do get through Israeli bombardment, and more recently, the growing desperation of hungry mobs have turned food distribution into an arduous and sometimes deadly endeavour. Somehow, Israel has managed to try and make this all the fault of Palestinians too. This was government spokesperson Avi Hyman again. The problem that we're facing is that we are doing our utmost as Israel and together with the international community to get in as much um, humanitarian aid as possible. To, and we're trying to make sure that that gets the people that need it most. Now, what Hamas is trying to do constantly is to steal that, uh, that aid. So you have a, a situation like what we saw today where people are desperate to get aid because um, Hamas is not allowing them to get the aid that we are pushing through. Now, there are no uh, limits. People who live in, in the Gaza Strip will say, and I'm not, not, not at all denying what you're saying about Hamas and, and what they are doing inside Gaza, but also there is a clear issue getting aid into Gaza, and that, that is controlled by Israel, the amount of aid that gets in. And, and if you look at what happened today, perhaps does that tell us anything about the desperation of some people for the, for the meagre amounts of aid that do get in? There are no limits on the amount of aid that can go into Gaza. Let me say that again. There are no limits from the Israeli side. <laughs> oh, really? This is the Karem Shalom crossing on the border shared by Gaza, Egypt and Israel, where Israeli protesters have gathered to stop aid trucks from entering the territory. Among them are relatives of the hostages still held in the Strip. And this is the Erez crossing on the Israeli-Gaza border. Right-wing Israeli settlers have been trying to build a structure near the border wall with the Palestinian territory, which is exceedingly illegal. Now, settlers were herded back into Israel by the IDF, but no arrests were made. And they're calling on the government to allow them to settle in Gaza. Bombs, shooting, starvation and disease have now resulted in the killing of more than 30,000 Palestinians in Gaza. It's an incredibly bleak figure and is thought to be a conservative estimate by many analysts. Why? Because, as we've covered, it's not yet known how many thousands or even tens of thousands of bodies lie under the ruins of buildings shelled across the territory. Children and women have been disproportionately affected by the slaughter. Today, US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin confirmed that 25,000 of those killed have been women and children. And Joe Biden suggested that figure could now interfere with the prospects of a peace deal. It's remarkable to think that just a few weeks ago, Biden was warning that the figures from the Gaza and Health Authority shouldn't be trusted. But then just a few weeks ago, less people have died. So how much does the life of a Palestinian cost to US president? Now, the killing of 30,000 Palestinians represents the passing of a horrific point in this war, one that we all hoped would never be reached. Marking it, UN rights chief Volker Turk said this. There appear to be no bounds to, no words to capture the horrors that are unfolding before our eyes in Gaza. Since early October, over 100,000 people have been killed or wounded. Let me repeat that. About one in every 20 children, women and men, are now dead or wounded. At least 17,000 children are orphaned or separated from their families, while many more will carry the scars of physical and, in, and emotional trauma lifelong. Today, the total number of people killed has exceeded 30,000. And tens of thousands of people are missing, many presumed buried under the rubble of their homes. This is carnage. It is carnage. But in the UK, the response of our political parties to the unfolding catastrophe has been far from adequate. Only the SNP have been serious about applying pressure to Israel, the Tories have never managed to call for anything more than a humanitarian pause, and Labour has pulled every possible punch when it comes to a tougher approach to Israel. So who's opposing? Well, now the Lib Dems, surprisingly, have made their own suggestion for how to intervene in the crisis. The UK already sanctions a small number of extremist settlers in the West Bank, but Lib Dem leader Ed Davey has suggested sanctions be extended to include members of the Israeli government like National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir and Finance Minister Bezalel Smotrich. 
Speaking to The Guardian, Davies said this, The settlements are a massive barrier to peace and to a two-state solution. I think we've got to take some strong action now. I think we've got to send the strongest possible signal. Because of the trauma, there's a sense the prospects of peace around a two-state revolution have been reduced. Helena, we've had the SNP pushing Gaza ceasefire votes on their rare opposition days in Parliament. Now the Lib Dem leader has said this. This is much stronger than the two main parties in Westminster, isn't it? And why is that? I mean, I think the first reason why they have the room to expand their position further than what you see from Labour and Conservatives is their proximity to power within Westminster. Because, of course, as we've seen many times throughout this conflict, when you're in the position of being close to power in Westminster, you're usually expected under the assumed positions that they take to be in some way beholden to the US State Department line on a lot of these things. We've seen zero deviation in earnest from neither David Lammy, David Cameron, Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, from what the US State Department say on any of these issues. Because, of course, the punishment of certain extremist settlers has been a Blinken position, which was adopted by our own government and our own opposition, but has been expanded on here by Ed Davey. I mean, the Greens, for a very, very long time, have held a position of sanctioning high-level members of government within Israel. And now the Lib Dems are catching up on that one there too. And really and truly, when it comes to people like Ben Gavir and Smotrich, this should be like the level zero position. Because when we look at the context of why Ed Davey proposes these sanctions, is actually not even around specifically this conflict. It's about the broader movement for peace, the broader violations of international law, and those barriers towards a two-state solution that is kind of the de facto liberal position on the peace agreement, on the peace process, sorry, at this point. Because, of course, the first barrier is the incursions by the settlers and the outposts into the West Bank. Once you've gone past the Green Line and you're violating international law, which again, this is the liberal international rules-based order that we get told all the time that we are the upstanding moral arbiters of when we violate it constantly. And so indeed do our allies. And whilst we may have words of condemnation for it, as Michael has said many times on this channel. Words mean nothing without actual pressure, actual material action to force Israel's hand on this through policy. Now, sanctions on people like Ben Gavir, who, let's be real, is a convicted terrorist in Israel under, under Israel's own law, who is now in government. For him to be in a position where he's not having sanctions, despite the fact that all of the things that have been going on, not just throughout this conflict, but all of the decades leading up to this have been violations of international law. The fact that it's now not a, a united position on this front in terms of the international rules-based order so-and-so, is uh, it's, it's honestly nonsensical to me. I would be going further at this point. We have so many statements of genocidal intent coming from plenty of ministers who have also been the ones who have been engaging in direct involvement with the genocidal actions, people like Yoav Galant, for example. We've got people like Daniel Hagari, the things that they have done in throughout the actual conflict, which hasn't been touched on so far. Ed, if you only mentioned, well, this is a barrier because of the West Bank and the two-state solution. When we what we really and truly need is enough pressure to stop the war and have an immediate ceasefire. And that involves also punishing people who are engaging in crimes of genocide or have whilst that case is ongoing at the ICJ, and trying to put so much pressure on for a long-term peace deal, at least in terms of a two-state solution, to make sure Israel withdraws past the Green Line. Because if they don't withdraw past the Green Line, then I don't think there's really any hope for peace. We know the government can act because, you know, just last week, to mark the two-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the UK and the US announced a bunch load a bunch more of sanctions um, against businesses and individuals, uh, including weapons exporters. But when it comes to Israel, we are the ones exporting weapons to them, which the government is trying to cover up still. They claim there's been no weapons exported since the 7th October. Yet there's 28 current licenses for exporting you know, parts of aircrafts, munitions to Israel. You can draw your own conclusions. A quick warning, because this report does contain details of assault that some may find particularly distressing. An inquiry has found that the serving Metropolitan Police officer who kidnapped, raped and murdered Sarah Everard had been previously reported to police for indecent exposure eight times before he killed her. Wayne Cousins is alleged to have also committed other sexual offences over many years, 
including a serious assault against a child. It has led the inquiry to conclude that he should have never been given a job in law enforcement and to warn police leaders to ensure another Wayne Cousins isn't operating in plain sight. Here is inquiry chair Eilish Angioloni. Sarah's murder by an off-duty police officer shocked the nation. It triggered a surge of discourse about women's safety in public spaces and started a tidal wave of reporting on police misconduct, particularly where officers misused their powers to commit sexual offences. What is already clear is how much damage Cousins has done to the social contract on which policing is based and how significant improvements are required. The evidence seen by the inquiry has shown that failures in recruitment and vetting meant Cousins was able to continue a policing career which should have been denied to him. Failures in investigations into allegations of indecent exposure meant opportunities to disrupt Cousins' offending and bring his policing career to a halt were missed. It is clear that Cousins carefully managed the impression he gave people of himself. This, is included, this included the way he manipulated information on application forms and his troubled finances. It also included the way he shared his callous views towards women with only a very small group of like-minded people on a social media group. This all enabled him to target vulnerable women while operating in plain sight as an apparently unremarkable officer. However, the fact remains that three separate police forces allowed him the privilege of being a police officer when they could and should have stopped him. The inquiry's report details Cousins' 25-year history of sexual offences. Those were factors that should have been flagged in multiple vetting procedures across three police forces. Cousins actually failed vetting by Kent Police, but was later allowed to become a special constable anyway. This is Angiolini again. The inquiry has seen evidence that Cousins allegedly committed a very serious sexual assault against a child, barely in her teens, before his policing career even started. Problems of money also predated his career with the police. Cousins had substantial unsecured debt by the time he was arrested for Sarah's murder. At the same time, the Metropolitan Police Service were taking action to recover up to £15,000 that had been paid to him in error and a year-long mortgage holiday was about to expire that month. These pressures undoubtedly affected his ability to serve as an authorised firearms officer at that time. I've seen evidence of Cousins' diverse and deviant sexual interests and understand these to be potential drivers for his offending. It is alleged that on a number of occasions, Cousins tried to show friends and colleagues pornography, including some of a violent and extreme nature. It is further alleged that on at least two occasions, he shared unsolicited photographs of his penis with young women and that he paid female online retailers to masturbate into clothes and send them to him. Other alleged offences committed by cousins include possessing indecent images of children, an attempted kidnapping at knife point, the rape of a woman under a bridge in 2019 and sexually assaulting a person in drag. The three police forces that Cousins worked for didn't just fail in their vetting, though. They also failed to take seriously multiple reports by the women he abused. This was another example Ailish and Giolini gave. In 2015, a member of the public telephoned Kent Police, having just seen a man driving a car while indecently exposing himself. This same witness gave the police the make, model, colour and registration number of the car information that was confirmed by automatic number plate recognition cameras operating in the area. In almost no time, checks by the police identified Cousins as a registered keeper of the car. However, despite having his home address and knowing that he was the only male insured to drive the car, Kent Police closed the case and took no further action. They did so without making any attempt to speak to a further witness or to Cousins himself. This was a grave error and a very obvious red flag. By failing to properly investigate the allegation, Kent Police missed a valuable opportunity to disrupt or even prevent Cousins' future offending and to bring into question his position as an authorised firearms officer with his CNC. 
Now, one case like that is a clear indictment of police procedures, and it's also emblematic of the ways in which members of these institutions go out of their way to protect one another. That example alone should be enough to shake anyone's faith in the police, assuming you had any. But tellingly, the list of police failures went on. Victims reported allegations of indecent exposure to the police on four occasions before Cousins' arrest. The two allegations reported to Kent were inadequately investigated. In addition to the 2015 allegation, Kent Police also responded to an allegation of masturbatory indecent exposure directed at a lone cyclist in a narrow country lane in 2020. With limited investigation, the case was closed. Had the investigation been more thorough, it is possible that Cousins might have been identified as an alleged sex offender and his offending and policing career disrupted. Just days before he abducted Sarah Everard, Cousins was reported for exposing himself at a drive through The investigation into these allegations by the Metropolitan Police Service also fell below the standards any victim of crime should expect. For example, available evidence such as CCTV was not collected or considered. He was only interviewed and charged for those further offences of indecent exposure after his conviction for Sarah's murder. He was convicted for two of the reported crimes at the drive through and the crime where he was reported for masturbating towards a lone cyclist on a narrow country lane. The inquiry is aware of five other alleged incidents of sexual offending involving cousins, which for many understandable reasons were never reported to the police. Given the known underreporting of sexual offences, I believe there may be even more victims of cousins offending. Andy Olini's report makes 16 recommendations for reforms to police vetting and investigation procedures. But it's difficult to be told that many of them aren't already a part of these procedures, including these. Any individual identified as having a conviction or caution for a sexual offence should be rejected during police vetting. Conduct a review of the circumstances of all allegations of indecent exposure and other sexual offences recorded on the Police National Database and the Police National Computer against serving officers. Previous failures to achieve vetting should be recorded by all forces and flagged to recruiting forces. This should also trigger a revet with the current or recruiting force. Every police force should commit publicly to being an anti sexist, anti misogynistic, and anti racist organization in order to address, understand, eradicate sexism, racism, and misogyny. Well, talk, talk tends to be cheap, is all I'll say. The report shows that time and time again, multiple police forces failed to respond to the allegations made largely by women about Wayne Cousins' misogynistic and violent behaviour, allowing him to continue to wield the power of a police officer and an armed one at that. In response to the report, Sarah Everard's family released this statement. It is obvious that Wayne Cousins should never have been a police officer. While holding a position of trust, in reality, he was a serial sex offender. Warning signs were overlooked throughout his career and opportunity to confront him were missed. We believe that Sarah died because he was a police officer. She never would have got into a stranger's car. Angiolini's report was laid before Parliament this morning, so the government hasn't considered it in full yet. But this was Home Secretary James Cleverley's initial response to its findings. We are taking action to address public confidence in the police. And there, have already been, there has already been progress in a number of areas that have been highlighted by the inquiry. Anyone who is not fit to wear the uniform, for whatever reason, must be removed from policing. And every effort must be made to ensure that similar people never join. That is why we're providing funding to the National Police Chiefs Council to develop an automated system for flagging intelligence about officers in a much quicker time than is currently the case. We're changing the rules to make it easier for forces to remove those who cannot hold the minimum level of clearance. And police chiefs are getting back the responsibility for chairing misconduct hearings so that they can better uphold the standards in the forces that they lead. And there will be a presumption for dismissal for any officer found to have committed gross misconduct. And I can announce today 
that there will also be an automatic suspension of police officers charged with certain criminal offences. That's James Cleverly, the man who made a date rape drug joke about his own wife. If you think that what Cleverly is saying doesn't seem like much, you would be right. The Angiolini report is just the latest in a series of scathing reports into policing in the UK. These include last year's Casey Review, which found the Met Police to be institutionally racist, sexist and homophobic, and yet little appears to have actually changed, a point that Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper made. Wayne Cousins should never have been a police officer. He should have been stopped and he could have been stopped from being a police officer. It is truly appalling. His history of alleged sexual offending stretches back so many years and yet opportunities to investigate were repeatedly missed. And most disturbing of all, Lady Angelini says, there is nothing to stop another Wayne Cousins operating in plain sight. So although I agree with most of what the Home Secretary has said, I have to be really blunt about this. His response is too weak. It is too little and it is too late. And the lack of urgency is unfathomable to me. The government has been repeatedly warned about failures around vetting and misconduct. Independent and inspectorate reports in 2012, in 2019, in 2022, in 2023, all highlighting serious failures in vetting procedures. That's why Labour called two years ago, I called two years ago for mandatory national vetting standards. Individuals are working, forces are working hard But there isn't mandatory standards for all forces. All the government has done is brought in a code of practice two and a half years after Sarah Everard's murder, which isn't strong enough. Frankly, it isn't even clear that Wayne Cousins or officers like David Carrick or Cliff Mitchell, both now convicted, would definitely have failed the vetting standards and the code of practice even if it had been in at the time. He has to go further, and it has to be driven by the Home Office. On the misconduct changes that he's referred to, most of them aren't even in place yet. Again, three years after Sarah Everard was murdered. And I don't know what to say, because I feel like we ask the same questions over and over again about policing in the UK. Is there any expectation of institutional change? What really should we be pushing for here? I mean... When it comes to institutional change, can we expect it? Um, I think the answer to that is no. But I think there's kind of two main reasons as to why, and there's a, there's a cultural reason and there's a political reason to why there's so many barriers to institutional change. The first, when you look at the kind of the cultural issues that we have, for when you look at when we've seen the history of policing in this country never, ever get better from the Stephen Lawrence movement, where we are now, is that because no one ever cried foul throughout all of this, continual slipping through the cracks because there is no material interest in calling out your peers within the police force. There is no reason to be a whistleblower when you know that all you're going to be able to gain from that is further distrust of the role that you hold, regardless of how noble your own personal goals or beliefs are in being able to approach that. Of course, from a leftist perspective, we all have a broader structural critique of why we don't think that policing can be reformed based upon the material interests that the police are there systemically to protect. But even outside of that, I don't subscribe to the idea that every single personal police person who is within the force is somehow tainted by their engagement. It's engaging in the role that I think that is the problem when you think about ACAB, for example. But given that this culture has allowed to continue unpeded as to now. The idea that without huge top to bottom reform, that we don't have the resources nor the funding nor the actual amount of boots on the ground to actually maintain, I think that's a real pipe dream at this point. The second political impediment that we have to any kind of reform on this is that one thing that's broadly a British value on this is that we have a belief in institutionalism in this country. It's one of the reasons why the Conservative Party have such a loyal voter base, both within the the party and and outside the party, is the belief in our institutions, because we're an old country, we're a country with strong ties to its own past, that is really difficult to be able to move. When you have the Conservatives in power, 
the vast majority of the time, they have this reverence towards the Peel reforms, which is the basis of the founding of the Metropolitan Police, which their party was literally responsible for. So if you have to try and get them to see there's not a problem with individuals or a problem with certain bad eggs that you can then change the personnel for, rather than a systemic problem that needs reforming from the top down, you're personally impugning their own sense of moral values that I think that a lot of people in this country share, even people on the border liberal left. When you talk to them about House of Lords reform, they say, well, actually, that's an institution that we've had for a long time. The problem's really the kind of people that you appoint. I'm like, well, no, because that's always going to be a problem based upon the system that you have. So having trying to engender a political change towards a centuries-old institution, I think is a really, really difficult uh, that's a really kind of difficult thing to cement into not just the political consciousness, but the public consciousness as well. I think it is really interesting to have watched the public confidence drop in the police. And I'd take my own mother as an actual example of this, who is uh, 70 years old. She once made me correct an article that actually had her age lower than it was, uh, who is 70 years old. And as a result, I would say, of the death of Sarah Everard, her trust in policing has dropped so much that I have watched her actually yell at police officers in the street that they're wasting taxpayer money by apprehending, you know, shoplifters instead of focusing on solving real crimes. And she's also got very involved in local initiatives around trying to tackle violence against women where she lives. Um, So I guess I'm trying to say that and there might be some hope in that people who previously would have taken as a given that the police engender safety upon us and now questioning that and trying to take action to change that. So they, the loss of public confidence can obviously be a pessimistic thing, but it can also be somewhere where you see people starting to take action in uh, demographics where they may not previously have done that. Please note, this story does contain language some may find distasteful. Because we're going to cover an unusual and tricky story now, one that will likely become more frequent, which is trial by emoji. A 26-year-old black man has just been acquitted of malicious communications after a three-day trial by jury. Now, we're keeping this man's identity anonymous to further protect him. And this man was first detained in January 2023. In the early hours of the morning, his house was raided by police. He was searched, taken to a police station and held in a cell for 10 hours. He was then searched again, he had his electronic devices seized and he was eventually arrested and charged under the Malicious Communications Act 1998. What was his crime? Well, the young black man had sent a raccoon emoji to this person, Ben Obsijecti. Now, who is Obsijecti? Well, he's a hard right conservative who is currently the Tory candidate for John Major's former seat in Huntington, Cambridgeshire, one of the safest safest in the country. His little taste of his opinions. Obsijecti is firmly embroiled in anti-woke, anti-identity discourse. He's also falsely boosted a claim that a visibly Muslim contestant on University Challenge had brought along a stuffed octopus toy in a supposed anti-Semitic gesture after October 7th. The University Challenge episode, it turned out, was recorded in March. Just to give you an idea of where this man sits. Now, the young black man who found himself on trial had been responding to a tweet that Obsijecti wrote in September 2022. Earlier that month, of course, 24-year-old Chris Cabber had been killed in London by a single shot to the head by a Met police officer after he was followed by an unmarked police car. After his death, Chris Cabber was found to be unarmed. Obviously, Jekti shared a news story about Chris Cabber's family deciding to step back from campaigning for justice after viewing body cam footage of the shooting. This is what Obsi Jekti wrote. Interesting that seeing the police body cam footage of Chris Cabber's shooting has rapidly de-escalated the story. MPs and commentators who reacted so hysterically now conspicuously absent. When he's talking about reacting hysterically there, he's talking about the people saying, you know, this was a crime. And he's saying, no, they've now seen the body cam footage, they're stepping back. Obviously, we now know that the Met Police officer has been indicted under a charge of murder. 
that was a year later. But at the time, in a now deleted tweet responding to Obsi Jekti's message, this 26 year old black man who wound up in court had quote tweeted it and further provided context to Cabba's killing. And he'd used this word, coons. He also replied directly to Obsi Jekti's tweet with a raccoon emoji. And it was the use of that term, coon, that Obsi Jekti reported to police as malicious communications. Now, coon was popularized as a racial slur initially in the 1800s, and it was used predominantly against people of African heritage in America and in, in, of indigenous heritage in Australia by white people. But in the 20th century, it took on an additional function, one that I recognize. The word began to be used internally by members of those communities to describe someone of the same ethnic background who was seen to be acting against racial solidarity, or to put it bluntly, siding with, as we would say, the white oppressor. And it's under that meaning that a black man was prosecuted for malicious communications. Now, this case and the word is controversial, and it's also important on several levels. And to find out more, earlier today, I spoke to a writer and broadcaster who attended the trial, Nels Abbey. And I started by asking Nels if the word coon was racist when used in this context. The word coon or so, when it's uttered from a white person to a black person, like the N-word, is almost blankly racist. When it's uttered within the community, it requires a lot more context than that. Because often it's often used to, to describe a particular type of politics that is pandering to racism. Ben Obersee Jekti, who is the politician in question, uh, has argued that the word coon is still a racial slur, even if repurposed by other black people, because... In his words, it's, quote, silencing dissent. Where do you stand on that interpretation? Nonsense. It's an, it's an utter nonsense. Actually, beyond just what I stand on, or where I stand on it or so too, I run an organisation called Uppity, which is an intellectual playground, which means that we have intellectual debates and many other different things. You've got to come along to it one of these days, Moya. We should get you up there. You'll, you'll see what exactly what I mean in a bit more detail. But we have a debate on these terms, coconut, coon, Uncle Tom, um, apple, as the, as the Native Americans actually say, uh, meaning red on the outside, um, white on the inside or so, meaning you're behaving like a colonizer or so, you're behaving like our colonizers have historically done. The, uh, Chinese and Japanese people use the term banana. So these the colonized people would develop shorthands and codes to describe the politics of the actual colonizer and the behavior that's actually done. So... Um, the idea that this is racist language is an absolute, particularly what the idea that's racist language or the word coon is racist when uttered within the black community is a complete and utter nonsense. It demonstrates the fact that you either A, don't really know much about the black community whatsoever, or B, are maliciously interpreting it, or C, I, or C, it could just be, in my view or so, and I'm not, I don't know whether it's A, B or C or if there's a D or an E or so, it could just be that this is somebody who is being willfully ignorant in order to actually put, in order to develop a platform and a curry favour with a particular party that he's trying, that he knows that saying certain things will actually make himself, it will endear himself to them and it might give him a powerful position or so. And it would appear that that looks like what may or may not have happened. Um, but the key thing here, as far as um, the actual language, the actual language is, no, it is not racist language when uttered in the black community. In fact, it is often, 99% of the time, anti-racist language. What do you mean by that when you say it's anti-racist language? Could you elaborate a bit further? So it is describing, so the norm is, the term that people, when people use the term uh, coon or Tom, it is a critique of a particular type of politics, a politics that is pandering to racism. And you and I, everybody watching this probably knows that, look, the idea that British, some British ethnic minority politicians, not just on the conservative side too, um, um, pander to racism is a, is a known thing. I don't think it's controversial to say that we've had a Home Secretary who was effectively a brown white supremacist, at least one of them as well as Rabbitman, maybe more than one of them or so too. But so when people come and describe this type of, describe them in these type of terms or so, they're doing it to describe that, to pretty much say, to give a shorthand that this person is behaving, not as like a generic white person per se, but behaving in a racist manner that could potentially be harmful to us. Moya, systemic racism is real. 
And systems don't create themselves and they don't maintain or sustain themselves. They are created and maintained and sustained by people and behaviors and things that people are willing to turn a blind eye to. And, particular, and what we are seeing, particularly the post Windrush scandal, in which we've had nothing but ethnic minority um, um, home secretaries, it pretty much became clear in that landmark moment or so, as far as the Windrush scandal was concerned, there was a sea change that the state racism, which is often curtailed principally to the home office, um, could no longer be waged as effectively as it could be with a white face. So they found brown faces to actually do the exact same thing. And so the idea, the, the liberal expectation is that black and brown people are just going to have to either eat it or just pretend as if this black and brown person who's pretty much um, uh, being the face of state racism or so is a normal politician. In reality, is that we do that, but sometimes too we also use language to describe it. That is language that is um, rooted in our history as colonized people, um, as colonized people or historically oppressed people. But it's also rooted in um, in today, in reality, of the fact that look, this is somebody who's pandering to racism. This is the language we use to describe it. It is anti-racist language. We recently saw the Met Police interview a woman of South Asian heritage um, under caution after she was suspected of committing a racially aggravated offence, I think, under the Public Order Act. And that offence was holding up a sign showing Rishi Sunak and Suella Braverman depicted as coconuts, a term that we've outlined what it means here. What do these cases tell us about policing of offence? Who gets to be offended? I am not aware of anybody being prosecuted for being racist towards, say, a Diane Abbott. Or a or, or any other or Di, or um or Dawn Butler or any other number of black MPs or black public figures or so maybe that might be as a result of the fact that they don't every time they receive a piece of racist abuse they don't walk across the road to the police station and go and report it and therefore clog up the time of the courts and everything else. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> that might be as a result of that, but what we're seeing here is yes that. The hate crime laws that were meant to be used effectively to protect, in the principle, ethnic minorities, gender orientation minorities, sexual orientation minorities, you name it or so, has been effectively weaponized against us, essentially. So it is nothing short of the, the trial, the, the emoji trial that I sat through was nothing short of insane. Nothing short of it. It was one of the most surreal experiences I've ever been through. I also found it bizarre that somebody who complained to the state or complained to the police that um, that this was so racist now, so hurt or so, everybody had to stay in that court for three days. Ben Obes ejected, showed up for about 20, 25 minutes, said what he had to say and left, and that was it. It was a complete waste of everybody's time. Flagrant waste of everybody's time, that was it. And we're seeing the same thing. I don't want to say too much about the young lady who held the placard at the Palestine March because of the fact she came along to Uppity and actually told her story there. She told us everything she's been through. It is insane what she's been through already. I want to point one thing out to you too. I'm not going to say who, but there's, but this is actually, I want to make one thing clear. This is not Ben's first rodeo. Ben has ben actually secured prosecutions of black people for this language. So it's not his first rodeo. I don't even think, I'm not sure how many people he's done it, but I know there are other people out there. He even, he's gloated about it on Twitter and he even said it um, on the stand too. So, um, but more importantly too, one of the things we found interesting, one of the cases that somebody came to me with that they were going through, that somebody spoke to me about, when the person was a re was a questioned under caution or interviewed under caution, the police pulled out the tweets of a com of a I'll say a, a liberal, a fairly prominent liberal commentator who's of ethnic minority, who's an ethnic minority, and put him in front of her. When she said no, the placard or, or whatever it might be, so this was not racist; it was satirical. <laughs> They pulled out the tweets of a prominent, of a prominent liberal ethnic minority commentator and said, well, this guy is a very prominent ethnic minority and he thinks it is racist. From what you've said, what is happening in police questioning is that social media is becoming very real. And not only that, but right wing figures of ethnic minority 
are leveraging their platforms to be able to attack critics also from ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, how do we as anti-racist or even as leftists handle discussions like that? Because it seems like it's going to come up more and more in the social media age. And now that we're seeing these court cases actually prosecuted. I think that's a very, very good question. Um, and you're right. Yes. Um, the, the, the Some of these voices on the right are definitely using the lives and livelihoods and the odd flagrant tweet here and there to pretty much um, to pretty much promote themselves and give themselves bigger platforms than they would have otherwise. And it works. It really does work that we're going to have a black or brown prime minister very, very soon who's probably going to be as right-wing, if not further to the right, than saying he's not power. And that is no exaggeration because there's some of the people who are coming right now, uh, one of them um, who in particular, so I would say, is certainly, certainly, certainly much more effective and committed a racist than Enoch Power ever was. So how do we respond to this? I really and truly do. Keir Starmer himself made it clear that we need to be careful about the instant nature of social media responses or so, and the flippant nature of it and, um, and how we potentially police that and be careful in how we prosecute it too. Because somebody, when the Malicious Communications Act was developed in 1988, if you wanted to send, say, a hate letter to somebody, it was the old school cut out a newspaper and copy and paste, literal old school cut, um, um, cut and uh, paste um, glue words together on a sheet of paper and then to put it to that person's address and then see what happens there. Then the police would have to track the person down. This is very, very different right now. This is instant communication of which people have loads upon loads upon loads upon loads of, um, of tweets going around every, every single day. Today is the 29th of February. I have received over 12 pieces of racism today alone. If I walked into the police station, I would have been 12 visits to the police station already today alone. I'm not in the business of doing that. How do we respond to it? I think we have to recognize the difference. In this unique situation, we have to recognize the difference between intracommunal um, political critique, which may be serious or may be satirical. But we have to recognize that these communities sometimes have their own methods in which way they criticize people or so. And some of the language might sound a bit alarming to you if you just flip the terms, whatever white person said that, would that be racist? White and black, changing the terms or so are, is simple to do. Changing the history and putting it in context of where we are right now is is impossible to do. So I think we need to be very, very careful with that. We have to put pressure on the CPS to make sure that they are doing cult they, they are culture, they have people who can actually advise them on what is culture, on cultural awareness and astuteness, what is really a hate crime and what is just somebody trying to promote themselves um, or, or pretty much flirt with the Conservative Party and do, being a pick me for racists or so. And then also to, I'll, I'll say it finally, above all, there has to be a support mechanism for people who are going through these horrors. That young man was lucky. He had a legal aid barrister and a legal aid lawyer. And truth be told, um, at first, they didn't feel me with the most confidence in the world. He just got lucky. He wanted to go private to get himself a good lawyer or so, and it was going to cost him £13,000. He just didn't have that money. He's a very, very young man. But we need to make sure on the right or so, they've developed the Freedom of Speech Union or the Free Speech Union or so on the left, where we are more susceptible to prosecution as a result of these things. Or so we have to develop some sort of mechanism to support and help people through these things. The government have released annual figures on homelessness and they're not pleasant reading. The number of people sleeping rough in England has more than doubled since the Tories came to power in 2010. And the last 12 months have seen especially big jumps in street homelessness. Nearly 4,000 people recorded have been sleeping rough in England on a single night in autumn last year. It's the largest annual increase in rough sleeping since 2015. Record numbers of people also found to be staying in temporary accommodation in the same period too. Now, the Tory 2019 manifesto promised that they would end rough sleeping by 2024. It's now 2024 and rough sleeping is at a record high. According to the housing charity Shelter, the main cause of homelessness is not being able to afford to rent or buy a home, which makes sense. Private rents in Great Britain hit a record high in January 2024. London unsurprisingly had the biggest jump. The average rent of new property coming onto the market in the capital is now nearly £3,000. But outside London, monthly rates have jumped by 9% too. 
Meanwhile, when it comes to home ownership, there's been celebration about recovery in the UK housing market. Buying and selling activity is increasing again after a slump driven mainly by the south of England. But who is actually doing the buying? Well, an investigation by the I newspaper warns that it might not be first-time buyers picking up the keys. According to this research, first-time buyers have been priced out as Wall Street mega landlords buy up UK new builds. So North American private equity firms have massively scaled up their investment in UK new build property. In 2023, more than 38% of investment in the UK property market came from private equity firms. The year before, it was only 16%, and it was North American companies who accounted for more than a third of that investment. The I reports that these companies have, quote, increasingly expanded their focus from flats to family houses in the UK. Essentially, people not on the property ladder can't afford to buy homes and small-time landlords, such as pensioners with one or two homes, are being pushed out by higher interest rates and tax changes. Into the breach steps massive private equity firms like the Blackstone-backed Leaf Living, which bought 1,500 family houses across the UK in a single 2023 purchase. These firms sniffing around as a weather vane. This is what a representative from London Renters Union told the eye about the boom in private equity UK property investment. Often the rent is going up, but there's ser- really serious issues with the building that haven't been fixed. Their entire business model is these really high returns, really short term thinking, get money in quick and then get out again in seven years. They don't really don't have any interest in the long term stewardship of the quality of the buildings. For a while, these kind of investors were less interested in the UK. The fact that they are now taking more interest tells us something about the UK housing system, particularly since COVID, with these just skyrocketing rents. Helena, is there anything on the horizon that could ease this housing crisis? Well, to understand where the positions of, say, for example, the major parties in this country stand and also where potential better solutions could be, we have to really understand how we got here. And of course, the real problem that we have with the housing crisis is house prices overall, continually for the last 40 years, ever since right to buy happened, which is one of the biggest kind of patient zeros for the problems that we have at the moment, is the continual over-marketization of our housing sector and a very large demographic, the boomer demographic of an electoral cohort that every single party relies on to win elections and their overall ownership of large amounts of equity within the housing market. And this has incentivized governments to continually ratchet up house prices year after year, decade after decade, election after election. What happened in the wake of 2008 was that we had this really long period of 0% interest rates and a shift of quantitative easing in the brown era, which usually went into influencing supply, into the conservative era, where this quantitative easing continually went into bumping up asset prices, using the, especially from the financial sector and those who, are, who owned assets, housing being one of those things. On the other side of that too, we've also restricted supply of housing through planning laws and through not building via the state. So what's happened, the confluence of all of these things is that during the 0% rate era, mortgages were easy to come by, affordability um, affordability was easy on them because 0% rates kept mortgage costs low. And also because house prices had just crashed after 2008, there was an ability for people to have the deposits together to be able to get onto the housing ladder. Then, of course, those house prices have continued increasing because this is the Conservatives' electoral demographic, and it's never come down since. The reason why cash buyers are getting involved into the market now is because the massive increase in mortgage rates has left normal buyers far less likely to be able to be getting into the affordability for mortgages on these properties. And so cash buyers are the only people who can buy. And the restrictions on supply means that people who are using property as a large scale investment like Blackstone, like TSB, all of those investment companies know that restrictions on supply means it's a guaranteed investment. Matt Darling from the Nis Canaan Centre has done really good work on showing how these supply restrictions have allowed in over-marketized housing sectors, private equity firms to use this as a guaranteed continual increasing equity investment. So how do we solve this? What's the solution to these problems? Now, we will have to look to the country in the world, which is the only one in the European Union where the homeless population is falling. And that is in Finland, where they have social housing and then they take homeless people and they put them in the houses. Like That's the easiest way to solve the problem with rough sweeping and homelessness, as we saw at the start of this segment. And of course, the way we would do it in the UK is by building council housing. We need to build council housing and it needs to happen now. We can't let private developers into it. Otherwise, we'll get what's happening in Woodbury Down and Hackney, where the 
demolishing a, a council housing estate and they're replacing it with 17% social housing and loads of luxury waterfront flats, which gentrifies the area and is also unaffordable for most people unless we actually change what affordable even means because it's still not even affordable at 80% of market rents. So given we know that we have to build council housing and we need to build it now, not tomorrow, not after breakfast, now, what are the parties going to do? Well, Labour have already ruled out spending new state money on council houses. This was what Rachel Reeves said on Laura Coonsberg last year on her show, well, I've been in 2022, and they've not changed their position on right to buy either, which is patience here for this whole problem. Ironically, the Conservative Party have said that they want to allocate a very small amount of money to council housing, but neither of these are in any way close to the scale of how many new council houses we need to build to replenish our social housing stock to end the whole social housing crisis and to be able to actually have the stock available to put homeless people into the houses and those who can't afford into the private sector and also it would bring rents down by increasing supply and competing with the private sector too. On top of that, I think we need to have more draconian legislation stopping these private equity firms being able to buy huge rows of houses at a time. Andrew Fisher's talked about this on BBC Politics life too. And I fully support his, his policy prescriptions on these. We just have to ban overseas private investors from buying houses in just to be able to use an investment vehicle. They have a society utility and that is for people to live in. And we have to ensure that that is what happens rather than just being used as a way for the super rich to be able to further enrich themselves even more than they have done over the last 45 years. Thank you, Elena, for joining me tonight. And Thanks so much to all of you watching at home. Come back tomorrow for another live stream from 6pm. You have, as always, been watching Navarra Media. Good night.